Um, we're also concerned about people in the community who need to know about PrEP so they can come to their doctors and ask for it because doctors are busy. They're focusing on lots of other things. If the patient doesn't bring it up, um, often the provider will not bring it up. Unfortunately, we're not doing so well in general population awareness of PrEP. So the bottom line is those who had ever heard of PrEP before the survey. And what you see is that there was a very slow, gradual increase from about 5% in 2009 to about 8% in 2014. So most of the general population of people have not heard about PrEP. That's also important in terms of supporting people who are on PrEP. Um, because the, the more, you know, if, you're, if you tell your sister that you're taking this medication, if your sister already knows about it and thinks it's a good idea, you're in better shape than if she says, why are you doing that? Why don't you just stop doing whatever? So we're trying very hard um, in the next year to make inroads with that. However, what was interesting was that we then asked them, would you take PrEP yourself? If it was 75% effective, would you take it yourself? And what you can see is that 40% um, or so stable across time said, yeah, I would take it. But then we said, would you recommend it for a family member or a friend who you believe is at risk? Twice as many were willing to recommend it to someone else. That's the way we are as human beings. Not me, but that person over there, my cousin who does this. So um, again, I think we can make good inroads with the general population in raising awareness so that they're more supportive of other people taking it, even if they're not willing to take it themselves. This is an example of a simple message that we have on the CDC website, and a number of clinics have downloaded this, put it in their waiting room, um, because it's a very simple way to sort of say, um, to sort of talk about PrEP without getting overly technical. In addition to help patients talk to doctors, because we had heard that patients were going to their doctors and their doctors were saying, we don't give antiretrovirals to negative people. I don't know where you heard that. That is not a practice. Um, so we wrote, we, we worked a lot with our community-based partners and we wrote this brochure, which is downloaded a lot. Um, this, is, this is one of the pages. On the flip side, there's a whole set of things you need to do before you go for your doctor's visit, things you need to do, um, to do during your doctor's visit, and things you need to do after your doctor's visit. But we asked them things, and we also provided a page there, resources for your provider. So if your provider says there's no such thing, you can leave the pamphlet with them and say, here, look, yes, there is. CDC has guidelines, here's where you get them. Um, so that's been very popular, and it's available in both Spanish and English. Goal three had to do with reducing disparities. And one of the biggest disparities we have in HIV are racial and ethnic disparities. However, in the context of PrEP, what's been most interesting in talking with particularly black MSM is that they say, the whole Truvada whore thing is overblown for, as far as they're concerned. They, when you ask them what, what sources of stigma are most problematic in your life, um, I was actually in a public meeting where they had those little clicker things and people voted. Socioeconomic status was the one that they said caused them the most trouble. They're treated badly in healthcare systems because they're poor as far as they're concerned. Um, Sexual orientation is an issue, race, ethnicity is an issue, um, but also age and gender. Um, either being of young age, you shouldn't be doing that at your age, or being of older age, you still doing that at your age? <laughs> so <laughs> it's, been, it's been really interesting trying to think about how all these different stigmas come into play in terms of prep. In terms of race, ethnicity, CDC did a calculation of the lifetime risk of an HIV diagnosis 
among people who were HIV negative at the age of 18. The lower the number, the higher the risk. So, for example, for all race ethnicities, one in six MSM will get HIV infection in their lifetime unless we do something about it. Among African American MSM, it's one in two. Among Hispanic or Latino, it's one in four. What's interesting is that in all risk groups, blacks have the highest risk, lifetime risk, and among heterosexuals and persons who inject drugs, females have the higher risk um, across all race ethnicities. So when we say, um, but even there, when you look at black women, for example, compared to other women, black women have the highest risk. So these are the people that we want to get with, um, with PrEP or other effective prevention methods. Yet when New York State looked at their PrEP prescription data among Medicaid recipients, um, what they found was that only 14% of their PrEP patients were black. Um, and in fact, the majority of them were not particularly young. They were 25 or older. And as we know, HIV infection, new infections are rising fastest among people under the age of 25. So we have a ways to go. The other kind of disparity we're focused on is the socioeconomic disparity, access to health insurance, access to income. This is that same lifetime risk data, but coded by region of the country. And what you can see is the lifetime risk is highest in the Northeast and the South of the United States. On the other hand, if you look at the states that have decided not to expand Medicaid, it looks almost the same. So particularly for MSM, who are not um, generally eligible for Medicaid because they're not in families um, that are eligible, um, this is, this is a serious problem in terms of accessing all health care, including health care related to PrEP. However, um, it's a little complicated, but there are ways to cover the cost of PrEP care for both insured and uninsured people. And so again, we pulled together some groups and we made this pamphlet on paying for PrEP care, which you can download and I'll let you go through it. But it's basically, if you're insured, it's generally covered. If you're uninsured, then you need to determine whether they're eligible for ACA coverage. Um, if they're totally uninsured and not covered and can't be covered by ACA, for example, if they're undocumented, there's one way to get them services. Um, if they get ACA, there's another way um, to get them the services. And we broke it down in terms of how to get medication, how to get labs paid for, and how to get clinic visits paid for. Um, if you utilize all these methods, it works really well. So this is from Seattle, Washington, where they had established their own drug assistance plan for the state. And then they looked at the first year of data for patients who were coming in. What they found was that 58% of them had their care covered by private insurance. A quarter were covered by Medicaid or Medicare. Um, another 11% were covered by the Gilead Medication Assistance Program. And only 6% of patients actually needed the drug assistance plan that they had implemented. And less than 1% um, had out-of-pocket costs for PrEP. So again, we remember the patients who had the worst struggle, but that's not the majority of patients. That doesn't mean that we have, don't have to deal with their issues, but we shouldn't blow it up and make it sound like all the patients are having this terrible problem. Um, other studies have looked at this and found a similar thing. It's not just a Washington State thing. So for example, in New York, based on this data and some calculations that they did, they set up a PrEP assistance plan, but it doesn't cover the drug because the drug can be gotten from Gilead for people who are uninsured. 
Instead, it covers lab costs and clinic visit costs for people who don't have insurance. Um, the other thing that we've been working with partners to look at is, okay, so now PrEP is rolling out. How do we know how we're doing at multiple levels? So for providers, um, we're doing a lot of work with um, large insurers and with um, clinic systems to try to understand how to introduce PrEP into clinical practice. Um, and some of the lessons learned to date have to do with the importance of informing, educating, and engaging all staff who have patient contact. Um, because if the person presents at the front desk and asks for PrEP, that person doesn't know about it, they're going to get sent away. Um, the other thing is, you've heard some other people talk about this here today, but the whole idea of team-based care is particularly important in primary care settings. So when we say clinician, we say that in a very broad sense. We're not talking about doctors. We're talking about doctors, nurses, physicians, assistants, um, even social work, clinical social workers. We're talking about people who provide services in a clinical environment. We've also heard um, that, that most practices have benefits counselors, if they're large, they have benefits counselors who are used to negotiating the insurance issues for all kinds of health issues. Well, you need to go to them and make sure they have the knowledge of how to negotiate PrEP benefit issues. Um, and then Dr. Kwakwa, for example, was pointing out that in her clinic system, they took the best benefits counselor that they had and had her go and educate all the other benefits counselors at all the other clinics. Um, the other thing we've heard from clinics is that sometimes we approach them saying, okay, here's what you do for adherence for PrEP. And they say, um, why? I mean, I do adherence counseling for my diabetics. I do adherence counseling for my hypertensives. Can I use the same systems that I use? So some clinics, for example, are taking the nurse educators who do diabetic counseling and training them to also do PrEP adherence counseling. But again, thinking within your system what's currently available that can be modified as opposed to adding a whole new system. Because if you want to have a whole new system, then what we hear from people is, where's the money going to come from? Are you going to fund that system? And what's going to happen when that system goes away?